Okay, I guess uh, I guess we can start. It's uh, it's the first time. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a great crowd, and uh, we're all very happy to have you here uh, to talk about uh, the financial crisis and and financial history uh, under the the title "Gaming the System," which is really what it's all about. Um, before uh, I introduce myself and the panelists, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. First of all, uh, we ask you to silence your cell phones. Um, and uh, we point out that personal recording of these sessions is verboten. Uh, there will be a book signing uh, for uh, all the members of the panel and myself. Uh, right after this session, uh, I'm asked to tell you that uh, if you are buying a book, you buy it upstairs in this building in the lobby, and then uh, the signing will be across the street. There'll be booths there where we'll we'll sign them uh, after you buy them. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, once again, welcome to all of you. Um, uh, we're privileged to have with us today three authors who've taken three very different approaches to reporting and analyzing the financial crisis that began in 2008 and in many respects is still with us. Uh, before I introduce them, I'll introduce myself. I'm Michael Hiltzik, I'm business columnist at the LA Times, and I blog for the LA Times at a page called The Economy Hub, which you can find at latimes.com. Uh, I'm also the author of this book, The New Deal, A Modern History, which uh, the paperback edition of which came out last year which you can get upstairs. Um, as I mentioned, the three authors with us today have all taken uh, these very different approaches uh, to the financial crisis, but their books all have a common thread in that they address issues of financial industry regulation and history and the ways that incumbents in this big, sprawling financial industry have managed through the years uh, through a combination of political influence, very well-funded lobbying, and misdirection and deception to avoid the sort of regulation and oversight that would have done much to avert the financial crisis of a few years ago and would do much to keep the same thing from happening again in the future. So uh, on my left, though it's hard to be to my left uh, too much, <laughs> uh, as some of you... <laughs> Uh, who've read my columns might know, is Nomi Prince, whose book published, I, th I think, just this week, right? Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday is uh, All the President's Bankers, The Hidden Alliances That Drive American Power. Nomi is a former Wall Street executive who's written for a wide range of publications, including the New York Times, Fortune, Mother Jones, and The Nation, and that's a pretty broad spectrum of uh, publications in the United States. And her book exhaustively examines the relationships between banks and bankers on the one hand and our national government on the other, going back to the turn of the last century and bringing the, st the story forward pretty much to the present day. Um, on my right is Anat Admadi, who is the author, uh, the co-author, I guess, of The Banker's New Clothes, which is uh, also just out in paperback. Uh, the subtitle is What's Wrong with Banking? and what to do about it. Uh, and that is George Parker, professor of finance and economics at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. And uh, I know from personal experience, is one of our most uncompromising and penetrating analysts of the banking sector that we have today. Uh, her book shines a spotlight on how the banks have avoided what could be the most straightforward and most effective reforms of their industry since the crisis largely by lobbying, and uh, I hope I'm not being too blunt, by, by lying. <laughs> uh, and on my far right, uh, just uh, topologically speaking, is Helene Olin, one of my former colleagues here at the LA Times, uh, whose book is Pound Foolish. Here it is, Exposing the Dark Side of the Personal Finance Industry. Uh, Helene's work has appeared in The Washington Post, Salon, Slate, and Forbes. And her book really lays bare the, the charlatanism that underlies the personal finance nostrums that we're inundated with every day on television, online, and in print. So I'm going to ask our authors to start by each giving us some preliminary thoughts 
about their books, their themes, their motivations in writing their books if they wish, in fact, anything they want to say about their books and their subject that they can fit into, say, five to seven minutes each. And then we'll move on to a broader discussion and ultimately to your questions. Uh, so Nomi, why don't you start us off? Okay. Thank you. And it's just an honor to be here and with this amazing panel. We were all sort of golf carted over here, so we had a good 10 minutes to talk <laughs> about each other's things, and we've known them historically as well. Um, I came here by Uber, and the man who was driving the car asked me what I was talking about, and I explained, you know, this is a book about presidents and bankers, and he's like, yeah, it's really tighter than ever now, and I'm like, yes, it is, and he said, well, but I, I hear it's gone back like a hundred years. This is nothing new, and I said, yeah, you know, it's exactly what, what I, I talk about in my book, and he said, and, and it's, it's not just about, you know, Wall Street and Washington. It's all that the families. He's like, it's the blood and the marriages, and I'm like, you're quoting me to me. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it, it turned out he had, he had you know heard something throughout the week and, and just as an author you know you ask about you know talking about writing and books it's 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 so it was so amazing to have someone who wasn't related to me actually you know <laughs> talk about a, a, a theme that was out there that that is now part of his discourse it, it was just it was just a really really warm feeling to come here. Um, and the reason I, I wrote this book was because um, we know what's happened more recently in time. You know, I, I had worked on Wall Street before the years, before the financial crisis that just happened in 2008. And, and there's certainly an intense alliance and relationship and interdependence between Wall Street and Washington that I think we're all aware of. It's, it's pretty obvious when the heads of large banks don't go to jail and the heads of, you know, and, and, and small people who rob little stores do, you know there's a definite problem in, in society and justice and accountability um, and in everything else. And what we have today is a more concentrated power of wealth than we've ever had before. The big six banks in this country today control 84%, 84% of the deposits of all the FDIC insured banks, so therefore probably most of your accounts, as well as 85% of the assets of all banks, as well as 96% of derivatives. That's a phenomenal concentration of capital and leveraged capital in one set of hands. And this is after the financial crisis, but it didn't just get there accidentally. And so what I did was I looked at this idea of the big six, and I had been covering what was going on in Washington, and said, you know what, there, there's a lot more to this than just what's going on with the big six. And six is like this interesting number in history, because I had done a novel before this called Black Tuesday in which I did less research than I did for this book, but, but, but found a, a meeting that happened on Wall Street in 1929, on October 24th, Thursday, 1929 at noon, where the market was starting to fall, where all this unregulated speculation that had happened during the 20s was coming to a head, and this man named Thomas Lamont, who was the acting chairman of the Morgan Bank at the time, because Jack Morgan, who was the chairman at the time, was off like partying in Europe, and he got five other bankers together that collectively ran the big six banks of the time. And they were called the big six banks of that time. And that, that name had been coined by B.C. Forbes in 1917 and, and forward because it was about six bankers. At the time, those bankers were all related in some capacity. If they weren't related by blood, they were related by marriage. If they weren't related by marriage, their, their children were or would be. So there was a really strong connection in that room and this idea that, you know, we'll put in some money, we'll save the markets, we can do this, etc. But the story went back even behind and, and before those big six decided to save the markets from all the, the, the screw-ups that they had imposed upon them and what would become the Great Depression, which would be imposed upon the greater society and all of the population of the United States and, and globally, um, is that the ties back from the Morgan Bank went to the panic of 1907, actually even before that. At one point in time, J.P. Morgan had more money than the Treasury Department. And in the late 1890s, there actually were two mini